This video serves as a follow-up to another video released a few weeks prior. Please be sure to watch that video first, then come back to this one for some more nuance. I want to do some general housekeeping first. If you know how I work, then you'll already know that I entrust a method of teaching that relies on the concept of lying to children. This means, in my videos, I will often gloss over some technical aspects in order to address the wider point or perspective. My videos are never designed to be a definitive endpoint to any sort of debate or argument. And on that, I want to pick up on some points from the previous video that we glossed over, and add some technical detail. Firstly, something that frustrated me from the moment I uploaded the video was when I said LEDs convert energy into light. Although only a small point, it's still important that I address the fact that LEDs convert electrical energy into light. There, I fixed it. I've actually lost sleep over that one. Moving on a bit in the video, I mentioned a hypothetical bar lamp and the fact that some diodes hypothetically failed, leading to a hypothetical lamp that would be hypothetically dangerous in one half. Well, let's look at a very real example. Here's a lamp that I showed for a brief moment last time under the brand name Reptitrip. It has a range of white LEDs across the length of the lamp and some UVB diodes too. It's worth noting that it also uses absolutely no diodes to cover the UVA2 portion of sunlight that we discussed last time. This of course means that there is a potential risk that the lamp is intrinsically dangerous from the outright, something we discussed in detail in the zoo biology paper I've linked in the description. But even if we ignore that and pretend that the output is totally safe, this lamp has another problem. The diodes, or beads as they're often called at manufacturers in China, don't have a very wide spread. The beams of UV from the different diodes don't really overlap. If you stick a lizard under this lamp, you'd end up with a patchy exposure to UV. Now we bring in the fact that two of the diodes could fail, without the user being able to tell, and an entire half of the lamp would be totally unsuitable for UVB. This is obviously a problem, but there are ways to address it. Something that many companies do to try and rectify this is exactly what you'd expect. They use a different type of diode that has a wider beam angle. Because these diodes are spreading the UV out more sideways, they naturally aren't going to push the UV as far down. So the fix now is to add more diodes. This boosts the overall output, because UV is additive, and effectively creates a wide, even beam from the lamp. Under this lamp, an animal would have a much nicer, wider exposure to UVB. But you can see the issue. More diodes means more heat, and as we discussed last time, this poses a higher risk of component failure. The other thing we touched on last time, and I got a little bit of feedback on, was the wideband colour spectrum of sunlight and the narrowband nature of LEDs. Lots of people have said the animation really explained it well, and the concept of narrowband made sense to them after watching it, and that's great. But I have something to tell you. That was a lie. The truth is that LEDs are narrowband, but it's not quite what I showed in the previous video. It's more like this. This example blue diode is actually emitting a little bit of green, and it only peaks in the output in the blue. This is actually the perfect opportunity to teach you some terms. This diode, as we say, emits a peak output in the blue. And when describing LEDs, we call this the peak wavelength. There's other parts of the spectral output that we consider when looking at technical data for LEDs. For example, we take the area halfway up the peak and refer to this as the full width half maximum rating. This essentially gives us a simple idea of the spectral output of the LED without needing to see a full graph or a full set of data. You'll actually notice that the spectral output resembles a pyramid or a parabola. This shape of spectral output is often given a few names. It's common to see it called a Gaussian distribution, but actually the more technical terms would be a Lorentzian distribution or a Cauchy distribution. And something we look for in technical files is how this shape is spread out. The output isn't always equally spread, and we call this disparity the asymmetry factor, and that will become important shortly. Probably the biggest lie I told from the previous video was one that I actually asked you to play along with. We had to pretend that white diodes didn't exist. That's because white LEDs have some extra components that need a little bit of explanation, and it wasn't really helpful for the last video to go into that detail. But now that we're delving further in, we can actually explore white LEDs a bit more. High quality white LEDs are actually a blue diode, which, as we know, is pretty narrowband, and they're coated with a special chemical called a phosphor. The blue diode activates or excites the phosphor, which emits a much more wide band of colours. Add the blue output to the wideband phosphor output, and you create a fairly white colour for human vision. Here's an actual spectral reading of a white LED. You can see the peak wavelength in the blue diode, you can see the Lorentzian distribution we discussed earlier, and here you can see the broader colours being emitted by the phosphor coating. And we can do something quite interesting by changing the chemicals that make up this phosphor. Doing this allows us to add more colours to the total output. Here's another example, and you can see the same blue peak from the blue diode, but now this phosphor has an output with more red. This leads me onto a concept I touched on in the last video that raised a few questions. But first we need to expand our view slightly. Instead of just looking at the rainbow of colours from the sun, we need to look at what happens past the rainbow. So now we're going to look at the range of visible light, but also the range of invisible ultraviolet light. Ultraviolet light can, for the sake of today's video, be categorised into two. Dangerous ultraviolet and safe ultraviolet. 
And for a multitude of reasons, the types of UV diodes that we use for animals and vitamin D sit right on the border, like this. But of course, we know diodes don't actually output a single peak like this. They output a range. Well, for most UVB diodes, they have an asymmetry factor that skews their output towards these more dangerous UV wavelengths. And the peak wavelengths are usually 297 nanometers or 308 nanometers. This is because they're the cheapest and most readily available. There are more refined diodes available with an asymmetry factor that makes their output more favorable with more output in these good, safe areas of UV. But of course, they are much, much more expensive. Now, something we can try, and something we actively do try, is to add a phosphor. Similar to how we did with the white diodes earlier. There are chemical blends that work, and that would create an output that turns that narrowband UV into a broadband output. However, again, all of this research and development costs money and time, compared to relatively inexpensive fluorescent systems, for example, which a lot of the infrastructure is already in place for. And that's ultimately the bottom line with this new technology. LED UVB will be one of the biggest technology shifts for animals in the next 10 years. It will completely change the way we light our animals, at home and in zoos. I have no doubt about it. But the cost to develop the specialist UV diodes, develop a special chemical phosphor blend that doesn't decay very quickly, manufacture and mold special lenses to spread that beam out, but also don't degrade when being exposed to UV, and then to get that into a form factor that is practical, but also looks presentable and won't overheat, that's pretty expensive and not easy to balance. Before the lamp even goes to market, you've got costs piling up. And then when it comes to market, another company can very easily tear down your design and recreate it without all of those startup costs. You think if you'd put a whole bunch of research and development into making your UVB LED lamp safe, you'd shout and scream about it. This is the reason enough not to trust Amazon sellers of UVB LED lamps where there isn't independent data, a dedicated website, or even a spectral graph. So given all of that, I hope we've managed to touch on a few extra things in this video, things that we may have glossed over in the previous one, and I hope it's added some value to the first video. Thank you once again for watching. I'd love to know if you have any questions, corrections, or details about this video or any other video on the channel, or indeed any of the articles on the website please do get in touch in the comments or online. I can't wait to hear from you, but for now, I will see you when I see you.